Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Welcome viewers to thinktechhawaii.com. The show is the will of the people and I am your host, Martha E. Randolph. Today we will be talking about House Bill 2739, which is also known as the Our Care, Our Choice Act, which was signed into law by Governor Ige after this legislative session. My guest today is, Osh is Blake Oshiro. He is a vice president of Capital Consultants of Hawaii, and today he is representing the national organization, Compassion and Choices, which not only supported this act, but has supported acts of a similar nature all over the country. So welcome, Blake, and thank you so much for coming today. I'm really grateful. Thank you, Martha. Thanks for having me today. Oh, I'm so glad you could make it. Um, I am going to start by just turning this over to you. Let's start by telling people what the act actually is. What does it really say, and what does it mean? Yeah, so this law was modeled after the Oregon Death with Dignity Act, but there are probably a few more changes which have been deemed as safeguards to make sure that any of the concerns brought up by people that this could be abused is not going to happen. Mm -hmm. um, so a terminally ill patient, the person who actually is defined as not being able to have a prognosis beyond six months, is able to get a lethal medication of a prescription drug from their treating physician, and they have to have two physicians that co uh, concur with the diagnosis, that it's terminal, that they have no chance of surviving beyond prognosis of six months. Um, they then have to also get a psychiatric or psychological consultation to make sure that there's no depression or mm -hmm. other mental disorder that could be affecting their decision. Then they have to go through a waiting period, have to make two requests, and then finally they'll get the medication at which time they can decide on their own whether and when they want to take their own life. I see, I see. My understanding is laws of this kind have been in effect for close on to 30 years. Certainly, I believe Oregon was the first state to put it in. And I also understand that um, the fears that were voiced, which were similar to the ones you've addressed, there has been no case of abuse reported from any of the few states that do have such laws since their laws came into effect. So. Did, did that information assist you in any way in, in finally getting this law approved or addressing the concerns of people? Because for them to bring up such concerns and to face them with the fact that over 30 years no such evidence has been shown of any kind of coercion or force, um, it seems to me to be significant, and yet the same objections are raised. Did you find yourself facing that when this yeah, yes, was definitely. being introduced? I mean, a lot of people have concerns about the potential for abuse, or they hear anecdotal sort of stories about people suffering um, unnecessarily in a prolonged manner uh, in order to achieve their own demise, but none of that is really documented in mm. any of the evidence. Uh, you know, this is a highly monitored law under Oregon. They've had annual reports going on for nearly 20 years now. And what you can really see from that is it really is people that tend to have cancer, mm. um, tend to have severe cases of cancer, um, and most of them tend to be more highly educated. Uh, most of them tend to already be covered by insurance. Mm. Uh, most of them tend to be in the average to slightly above average economic income. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of evidence that this isn't abused. It's something that people choose to do. Mm. And in fact, I think it's actually something that a lot of people want to know that is out there for them when they're going through this difficult time. Some of them may decide not to take it at the end. Yeah, I they believe... They just want to know it's there. Yeah, I believe there are some t statistics. I was able to find that uh, in Oregon, since... Uh, they instituted the law, well, let's say 1998, uh, a little bit less than 2,000 people have requested the mm -hmm. medication in order to take their own lives, but about 1,300 have actually done it. And that's over the entire span of time from, uh, you know, 98 mm -hmm. all the way through today. Um, and in Washington, the state of Washington, um, since 2009, again, you have about 1,400 prescriptions written and about 1,360 actually having taken the drugs. So what it means is that more people over time have asked for the drug and chosen to take it, but it hasn't necessarily been 
an inevitable conclusion. A person can say, I would like to be able to make this mm -hmm. choice, so I make it, and then they can change their mind. And nobody will force them, because that's also a protection, I believe, under this law. Nobody can coerce you or force you to commit the final act. It has to be performed willingly by the individual who's requested the medication. Is that correct? Yes, it, it has to be self-administered. It has to be something that the patient themselves can take and no one else can assist them. And that's really what distinguishes it from the idea of physician-assisted suicide mm -hmm. or sort of um, euthanasia, which is oftentimes seen as somebody assisting somebody in a Kevorkian-like sort of uh, situation. But that's not the case here. It's actually a prescription drug that you take. Um, you get it in two different forms. One, so that it actually makes sure that your body is able to absorb the medication and you mm -hmm. don't regurgitate it. Um, and then the second one um, that you take a few minutes later is the one that actually actually ends up ending your life. Right. Okay. Well, that see that to me makes perfect sense. Maybe we can talk about how long has the effort been instituted here in Hawaii to get this law uh, through the signature and made into law and what are some of the experiences you had in the process? How long did it take? How many objections were filed and how many little legislative tricks might have been used to keep <laughs> it from going through? I think this is something that people would like to know in case they also have something they would like to push mm -hmm. through Congress, uh, local Congress. Yeah, um, you know, this has been around similar to uh, the Oregon law. In 1998, then Governor Ben Cayetano uh, commissioned a blue ribbon study to look at um, death and dying in Hawaii. And they came up with a number of recommendations in terms of um, hospice care, in terms of compassionate care, in terms of uh, pain and suffering. Um, but one of the recommendations they came out with was to look at the Oregon law, death mm -hmm. with dignity at that time, and Governor Cayetano put in a bill. Um, so it wasn't until 2002, um, in his last year in office, when a bill was heard by the Hawaii State Legislature. It moved out of the House, um, and then it got stuck in the Senate. Um, it went through a lot of rigmarole, being deferred, then having to get recalled onto the floor, then in a very dramatic final vote, it lost by two votes. Hmm. Um, so it failed to make it out of the legislature in 2002. Um, so it came close, but that was about as close as it came, um, because for the next 18 years, um, it, it didn't move anywhere. Hmm. Um, I would. I was in the state legislature during that time for the next 12 years. I tried introducing it every year. Sometimes I'd get a hearing, sometimes I wouldn't. Sometimes I'd get a hearing, but it would get deferred. Um, so it never really went too far. It had a lot of stops and starts. Um, and then it wasn't until 2017 that we were able to get it out of the Senate again. Um, it went to the House. They couldn't move it out. And then in 2018, they took it up again. And we were fortunate enough to get it out of both chambers and wow. then up to the governor's desk. What was the significant difference politically in these during these different times? Because the objections are essentially the same. They're the same ones that are raised every time. The points of view are usually represented uh, either as a religious point of view or some doctors indicate that it violates their oath, mm -hmm. which let us remind people, technically, it does not because the doctor is not assisting in any act of death. The doctor is giving drugs to the person to let them decide if it's their time to go. So please, this is not doctor-assisted suicide. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, I'm wondering what differences did you observe in the makeup either of the Congress or the political leanings of the time or any other pressure that was brought? because for 18 years to have nothing happen, and then all of a sudden to have something start to happen, although I believe this was a very productive legislative session, what did you observe? Because you've been involved from the beginning, it seems. Yeah, I mean, I, I think there were a lot of different things. You know, um, the landscape changed a lot in nationally. A few other of the Western states ended up adopting the law or passing it via referendum. And so at that point, um, Hawaii was sort of an outlier, right? Because you had Oregon, you had Washington, then you had California. Uh, and so the Hawaii and Colorado, was, I yeah, believe. Yeah, and so, so Hawaii was just kind of the natural next place okay. in order for this to happen. So I think that was a big change in the landscape. I think the other thing was, um, 
you know, we had already gone through really contentious debates over civil union, same-sex marriage, um, where a lot of the religious opposition had come out. And so I think by this time, um, supporters politically weren't as apprehensive mm. about that sort of opposition, where I think initially, you know, there was just a lot of fear about their ability to mobilize. Um, so I think that helped as well. Um, and then the third thing is just over time, I think when you look at the general public support for it, it just became overwhelming. Mm. And I think it became clear to the legislature that this was something that they needed to take up because mm. a supermajority of two-thirds of the Hawaii public supported it. Right. Well, I guess it is true that certainly over time, once you introduce an issue, over time, the general community's perspective on that issue will change, not only because of the facts that, you know, Oregon and Washington had these laws and had been practicing them, uh, but as you said, the, the opinion of the nation mm -hmm. and the view of life and death and its value, and more importantly, perhaps the right of a human being to have some influence over their own life mm -hmm, mm -hmm. or death. Yeah, and, and I think it gets back to, I think, one of the core things that your show is about is, you know, uh, some people view the Capitol as a place where just uh, bills get passed into law, and, yeah. and that's its main purpose. And that is, right? Its main purpose is policy-driven and making sure it does its legislative duties. But the other thing that the legislature can do uniquely, I think, is be a forum for discussion on public policy issues and contentious issues mm. that the public really needs to take up. And everybody's so busy in their day-to-day -day lives, mm. you know, driving to work, going to work, taking kids to soccer, going to grocery store, all this other stuff. It's very hard to sit down and think about these really meaty and heavy issues. Mm. And so it's when somebody like the legislature takes this up and you see it on TV, then I think it makes people kind of sit back on their kitchen table and say, like, oh, how do I feel? Exactly, how yeah. How does my family member feel? Mm -hmm. And it encourages discussion, and that's always a good thing. Right. And... Um in the course of working with this law, and I know you've worked with others, you are you are from an organization that specializes in assisting people who are getting documents mm -hmm. and laws written properly and gotten through over hurdles that yes, bar yes. them down. Yeah. Um, was there a great deal of testimony, and was some of it um, more effective in person than written testimony? What is your experience when addressing contentious laws, okay, as opposed to ones that are simply slightly debatable. Is the physical presence of the individual more important than uh, just a written testimony? Uh, what, what did you have to do to get this information out there and to start changing hearts and minds in the legislative offices. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, a lot of the discussion happens not just in the hearing room. It has to happen in meetings. It has to happen in when you're grabbing coffee with somebody. There's just a lot of different talk that needs to happen around the building. And so procedurally, you are correct. I think written testimony is always, always helpful, always welcome. Mm. Um, it is better if you go down and present your testimony live. It's much, much better if you're not reading your testimony, if you're speaking about it sincerely and from the heart. Mm -hmm. um, when it comes to issues like this, if you're telling a story about how it personally affects you, um, even more so, I think uh, people in the hearing will listen. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, they have hundreds of pieces of paper in front of them. They review all of the testimony. Right. And they can read it and they can see what it says. But in order to really capture emotion, passion, sincerity, that's the kind of thing that you have to convey via oral testimony. Absolutely. There. Okay, and Blake, if you don't mind, we're going to take a short sure. break at this moment, and I look forward to returning to the will of the people and speaking with Blake Oshiro from CompassionAndChoices.org and talking about the Our Care, Our Choice Act, which is similar to Death and with Dignity Acts of other states. So thank you. We'll see you in a few minutes.
Hello, my name is Stephanie Mock, and I'm one of three hosts of Think Tech Hawaii's Hawaii Food and Farmer Series. Our other hosts are Matt Johnson and Pamai Weigert, and we talk to those who are in the fields and behind the scenes of our local food system. We talk to farmers, chefs, restaurateurs, and more to learn more about what goes into sustainable agriculture here in Hawaii. We are on at Thursdays at 4 p.m., and we hope we'll see you next time. Okay, we are back with the will of the people, and we are talking about the Our Care, Our Choice Act. Uh, my name is Martha Randolph, and my guest is Blake Oshiro from Compassion and Choices Organization. Now, one of the things we were talking about when we went to break was basically how important it was to have people testify and why this session of Congress was different from others, and by that I mean local Congress. What else? made this time a better time, made this time the time we could get that bill passed, as opposed to not even having it considered in mm -hmm. the past 18 years? Yeah, you know, I think the, the it was helpful that in 2017, we had a hearing on the bill, um, the opposition came out and mobilized, we had really good support uh, from Hawaii residents and from the organization Compassion and Choices mm -hmm. and Death with Dignity National, and we really were able to bring in organizations organization and sort of a professionalism to the way in which we approach lobbying um, for this bill in 2017. Um, we didn't get as far as we'd like, of course. It got uh, deferred in the House after moving out of the Senate. Um, but I think in 2018, what it really did was set the stage so that the legislature was willing to take up this contentious issue, which is rare. Uh, I mean, I'll be very frank that in an election year, Typically, um, the legislature is not as um, uh, enthusiastic to take up contentious issues because it's so close to an election. Mm. Um, they prefer that if they are going to do something contentious, they do it in odd-numbered years, which is the non-election year right. rather than the even right, year. Right, right, um, right. This, but this year, they actually, going into it, said, um, you know, we looked at the information, we looked at the data, we looked at what the experience of other states have been. Hawaii's residents seem mm -hmm. to be very supportive of this. And so let's try and figure out if there's a way to address some of the concerns being brought up by the <coughs> opposition. Um, so there are a few more safeguards in here than probably any other law mm. anywhere else. Um, from compassion and choices standpoint, some of this we view as potentially problematic um, because it creates more barriers to access. Mm. But nonetheless, we're very, very pleased that the law passed. So I think all of these things mixing together and the legislature feeling like they've really invested into this, put in their suggestions, they mm. heard from the public, uh, amended the law accordingly, they feel like this is probably the best product <coughs> they can come up with at the time. And okay. so we'll see how it works yeah. starting January 1st. And then at that point, they said, if there are barriers or problems to access, then that's something we can take a look at. Again. Okay, so I believe in California, there were some legal challenges to the California law. Uh, is that something we could reasonably expect uh, in the future in Hawaii? And what about the opposite? What about if somebody wants to die and there's a provision in this law which eliminates them from mm -hmm. the ability to be considered. And they want to insist, no, I have a right to be considered even though I don't have an absolute six-month limit mm -hmm, on mm -hmm. my life. Or because it's not the kind of disease that is destined to necessarily kill you, but to de debilitate you and remove your quality of life steadily until you are just sitting and waiting mm. till your body gives out. Mm -hmm, which mm -hmm. is something sometimes it's difficult for a doctor to predict. Yes. So I would like to know where, where do people stand or what would they do if they felt that this law is supposed to apply to them and someone tells them it doesn't? Okay. Um, so the first thing, you know, in California, like you were mentioning, it's stuck in litigation, so we'll have to see where it all lands. Mm. It's in the courts. It's probably most likely to be appealed. It'll have to, we'll have to wait until the California Supreme Court issues their decision, um, until we have a, a firm understanding of where California is at. But I think for Hawaii, starting January 1st of 2019, when this law comes into full effect and people can start registering for it and availing themselves 
ourselves of it. I would not be surprised if we saw a legal challenge. Um, it would, i just speculating, similar to California, it may be a physician challenging it, saying, I don't want to participate. Um, but, you know, there, the law makes clear that no provider is forced to do this. Um, but the flip side question that you mentioned about what about somebody that wants to avail themselves of this and cannot. Um, legally, I think they'd have a problem because the United States Supreme Court has already indicated that there is no constitutional right to die. Um, they've basically stated that uh, this is a state issue in order to regulate how a person may choose to end their own life. Um, but a person does not necessarily have a constitutional right for ending their own life. Um, so somebody that's outside of six months or somebody that can't self-administer, they may be able to try and challenge the law, but I, I don't know if they'd have very much uh, ability to mm -hmm. succeed. Um, I think the law is pretty tightly written. So there's a big difference between an um, end-of-life directive uh, the medical forms that people fill out that they say do not resuscitate or anything of that nature and this law because the key is that the individual themselves has to be capable of giving themselves the medication Correct. and yet often a person would not make a decision that my life is simply no longer worth living until their body is so incapacitated that it, they can't do that. Mm -hmm. I believe originally Dr. Kevorkian when he introduced this entire concept um, he would have stepped in at a point like that and acknowledged the person's request, but the fact that they needed help. I believe it is also possible in other nations in the world. There are countries, and I don't know them all, Switzerland might be one, where um, an individual can ask and receive actual assistance if they are physically incapable of giving themselves that uh, the drugs necessary. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and, and here that they cannot. It has to be self-administered, um, and there's just no way around that. And Is, so, unfortunately, somebody that um, you know can't swallow for some reason, if they have uh, a you know, collapsed esophagus, for instance, mm -hmm. and they just simply cannot swallow, then they would have to figure out: Is that person willing to have a tube? You know, put down their throat in order to administer this, but they'd still have to administer it themselves. A person cannot grab the tube or grab the medication. And, and they can't have an intravenous line put in that they have control by pushing a button? No. Okay. No. Um, is that something that you think might be brought up in the future? Because I believe there are some places, are all, I'm sorry, let me start with the basic question. Are there any death with dignity laws that allow for an exception where an individual cannot swallow or cannot do much more than, say, flip a switch? No. Um, the laws that have passed thus far are self-administration. Um, so it's a very, it's a, it's a narrow sort of uh, type of way you can administer. And people that cannot do that cannot avail themselves of the law. Do you, or does Compassion and Choices as an organization feel that they are going to keep moving on this to expand the options for people who are in that situation, uh, it would seem to me to be the next step. Yeah. And I mean, uh, protection, yeah, I understand. Their concern is someone else would flip the switch. Mm -hmm. Well, the question becomes the evidence has shown that nobody is forcing anybody to die. This is not a contract you're putting out on someone's life. Mm -hmm. So, where do you think we're going to go from here with this? You know, I think we'll have to wait and see. There's going to be more experience in more states, more data that's gathered and more evidence. And I think the more and more we can show that this is highly regulated, that there are no abuses, it gives us the opportunity to look at where there can be improvements. And that may be an area that, you know, they have to open up and take a look at. But I would say right now, I don't think that's anywhere on um, the agenda right. because the idea is to make the laws work as best as they can for those that 
are able to avail right. themselves of it and then expand it to other states and other jurisdictions. Um, and then eventually we can start looking at how it could be changed. But I think the model is what they want to see uh, spread across in different states rather than continuing to grow just in the handful of states. So let, let's the more states that adopt this essential model with all the protections, the better chances you have to eventually begin to look into expanding or the parameters of such a law. But first, you have to get it accepted by more than six states. Correct. OK. Yeah. All right. One of the key arguments I believe doctors often raise in this question has been we don't need this law because we already have options available to us to help patients who are in so much pain that they want to die. And I believe in that case they're specifically referring to drugs like morphine, mm -hmm. which are often given to patients with terminal cancer or other painful illnesses. Mm -hmm. And they just keep increasing the dosage until the weakened body um, basically passes away mm -hmm. because it can't take it anymore. What makes this different from that? Because we are assuming now that a person who is in pain could be asking for additional drugs, and they'd be given it to them without having to have this law, as opposed to being able to say, I'm conscious, I'm alert, my mind is working, I know this is coming, and I would like this prescription so I can make the choice when the time comes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think there's been tremendous advances in pain management. I think when you talk to pain management specialists, they'll tell you um, that they really are much better at figuring out um, that sort of tipping point and how you get a terminally ill patient suffering in an inextricable pain um, to the point where they can just ease into their passing. Hmm. Um, but you are correct. I mean, a lot of it is uh, morphine or a high, high, um, really uh, borderline uh, almost puts them in a comatose state at mm. times. Um, so it really is an issue, I think, for people about their individual right and how they want to end their life. Mm. I think, like you mentioned, for some people, they don't want their last moments here to be remembered by family or for their own sakes to be in this sort of haze. Right. Mm. What they want is clarity, they want control, they want to be able to say their goodbyes, have that moment with their loved ones that they're not going to get again. And right. if you are sliding in and out of a morphine coma, you can't you're, you're not going to get that. No, right? you're not. And, and it's a, a very different type of goodbye uh, from everything we've heard of people that uh, do avail themselves of this is it's a conscious choice of when they want to do it and they gather everybody uh, and I don't want to make it sound like it's a ceremony but it is something where it's a clear understanding of this is where I'm at I'm gonna do this and there's an acceptance absolutely uh, and it's and, different than like we said and there's nothing market. wrong with having a ceremony most cultures and throughout the history of time have had ceremonies for both birth and death, and ceremonies are a very vital part of making the passing of any individual something you can deal with. Mm -hmm. And that is another discussion for another yes, day. Yes, so yes. we are out of time, and I want to thank you again, Blake, for being here and explaining all of this to us. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, you can always go to CompassionAndCare.org. Uh, Compassion, and they will tell you what you need to know about January. They will keep updating their website, and there's probably email lists you can sign up for. So be aware of that. And um, I want to thank you all for being here for this half hour. Uh, next uh, two weeks, I believe we're going to have Colleen Hanabusa, which could be a very interesting discussion. And I'd like to remind everyone that this Saturday is a voting Saturday. Mm -hmm. It is a Democratic primary, which for us in Hawaii is almost as big as important as a November election. <laughs> so I encourage you all to participate because a democracy is only as good as the voters who participate in it. So we will see you in two weeks. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.